and I was raining cats and dogs, and we went out to the pad and got in the ship and all ready to go, and uh, never cleared up, so we, we walked out, got soaking wet again, and we thought the game was over and we'd have to spend the money to certify all this peripheral software. But on the uh, 19th, the weather looked good. Start. Four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery on a mission to repair the Hubble Space Telescope as we venture into the 21st century. We had to lose one of our four EVAs, uh, cutting the mission short so we could get back before YTK. And we went up and we changed out the gyros again. We had a repeat uh, flyer, Claude Nicolier, uh, Steve Smith leading the EVA team, and, and my first EVA flight. And I, I just distinctly remember the first EVA day. We got to orbit, and first of all, uh, for those of you who have watched shuttle launches, incredible experience, but from the inside, uh, it's amazing that you can build optics or gyros and have it survive launch. You know, I fully expect when I get to orbit that the payload bay doors will open and stuff will be floating around, uh, loose, optics, pieces of things. Uh, but, you know, the engineering is done correctly and we get up there. And uh, I was on the end of the robotic arm moving towards Hubble. Jean-Francois Clairvois from the European Space Agency was driving the arm. And he took me back. I was going to meet Steve Smith, and we were going to start doing the, uh, opening the doors, the famous doors that Story had trouble closing. And I just couldn't resist. I was within about a meter of Hubble. And as I crept closer, I said, I just have to do it. And I just reached out and touched Hubble to make sure this was all really happening because it was just too surreal. Uh, inside of the spacesuit, you know, the Earth uh, 300 kilometers away, uh, just an incredible experience for me. And uh, stumped me back to reality a little bit because we had a lot of work. We did eight and a half hours of work outside that day to get the gyros and all the rest of the work done on Hubble. Uh, so even though we didn't get the four EVAs, which are normally six and a half hours long, we did get uh, three EVAs at eight hours long. Uh, I think that somehow uh, Seppi had a hand in that. <laughs> Let me now talk about uh, this most recent mission, STS-109, that we flew three years ago. Hard to believe that was three years ago. Uh, myself as a repeat flyer, we had a, a really expert team. Again, an incredible launch. Ed described uh, the daytime launch when we went through a cloud. This was actually a nighttime launch. Again, we went through a cloud deck. I hadn't exper experienced that before, nor had anybody on the, the flight deck, and we were all actually pretty surprised uh, because when you lie on the pad looking up at the sky, it's like this. There's all these lights in your eyes, so you can't see the weather. And we launched, and we got up to about 30,000 feet, which is only a few seconds, and uh, suddenly we see these clouds, and of course, it was black before that, and the clouds were lit up by our solid rocket motor exhaust. In fact, all of the light in that picture is from the solid rocket motors lighting up those clouds. A pretty spectacular event. But when we got to orbit, there was the beautiful Hubble with its uh, flexible European Space Agency solar rays. Uh, and we had to go to work. Uh, the, the really important thing that we did on this, this mission was to put in the advanced camera for surveys. And Jim Newman likes to talk about this because it's an amazing digital camera, 16 megapixels, uh, not the kind that you can get at Walmart. Uh, 16 megapixels is still a pretty good camera. And the, the beautiful thing about being in space is how easy it is to manipulate things. This was about 700 pounds or so. And uh, you know, Jim Newman could just hold it with you know, fingertip pressure. But we like to remind him that you know, it's worth about $65 million, and he probably ought to hold on a little harder. Uh, but just incredible seeing that go in. Uh, great achievement. We also put on new solar rays. Hubble is not as pretty as it used to be with those sunlight glows, but something very important, new, more powerful arrays. And on this mission, what we really did was to fix a number of things that are life extending, that give Hubble more capability, more capability to do science like the advanced camera for surveys, but also solar rays that provide more power that in principle allow us to do more science. We also did something that, that was my personal favorite uh, the power control unit. Uh, and one of the reasons my personal favorite is I remember sitting in Mr. Golden's office with, with Dr. Weiler. Uh, Mr. Golden was then the NASA administrator. And he brought us in to, uh, to remind us uh, how important Hubble is to NASA. And, and he asked Ed, you know, are you sure we should go and do this power control unit change out? And he asked me, do you think we can really do it? Uh, I'd like to, to give you the more colorful language that he used, but <laughs> I think maybe I'm more polite than Ed, uh, because it, it was really very entertaining. But he, he made sure in no uncertain terms uh, that if we were to go and do this, that we had to be successful. And like the first servicing mission, uh, this was uh, 
a task which involved a level of complexity and difficulty that was raising the bar quite a bit. Not a little bit, this wasn't an incremental change, but something where uh, we really didn't know going into it whether it would be successful. But of course, with, with a team like the Hubble team, uh, challenges are, are a siren song to say, you know, let's go try it. And through that very simple tool that you see me holding, uh, we were able to accomplish doing more connectors in a box that was very EVA unfriendly. It was not one of the ones that was in the white paper that says we should make these EVA friendly. This was a box that we never thought we'd have to change out. And not only did we do it, but we did it on the timeline, uh, which was very surprising. We had lots of margin to go longer and extra batteries and CO2 scrubbing. And uh, it, you know, I, I'd like to say it went like clockwork because there were two connectors at the end where I got there and I said, it's just not gonna happen. There's no way we're gonna get those. And with that little tool, we were able to do it. And so sometimes simplicity is your best friend. Uh, and, and that task went, went forward. And that removed a potential fault in Hubble that would have been life ending. Uh, there was a fault in the old PCU that could have brought all science to a halt, in fact, all of the telescope. And now we have a brand new unit in there. So it was with great pleasure for me, uh, again, a second time, to be able to see this view. This is what Hubble looks like today. Uh, it has the new solar rays. The reason this is such a great view is the aperture door is open, so it can do science. And from a crew perspective on board, when you see this view, for the most part, you're really happy because you didn't break the Hubble. That's always, that's always the biggest concern, uh, is that you know, you'll do something to make the telescope worse. And once again, we did five e EVAs. I think we had 100% success. Uh, you know, to me, a, a successful expedition is nobody gets hurt and everything else is, is uh, frosting on top of that and uh, we, we achieved everything and the science from the advanced cameras for surveys as you've seen and also the, the revived NIPMOS uh, has just been incredible since. Uh, you know, I've told people this many times but uh, I value my life and there are things that I think my life is worth risking, uh, things I would do that I think it's worth risking my life for and this is one of those where I think that risk has been worth it. Uh, the, the payoff to inspiring kids, uh, to the astronomy community is something that uh, is just fantastic for me to be a small part of. Um, you know, many people look up to astronauts as heroes, and I, you know, I, I think that's a good role model, but perhaps uh, misdirected. I think there are many heroes. Uh, and so I just wanted to, to pick on and embarrass a few of my heroes. Uh, the first one is I told you already is, is Dr. Weiler. I told him after one of my missions that he was my hero and we talked a little about the history and that's before I came up to headquarters uh, as the chief scientist. And it's just because I have followed Ed's career. Uh, he's one of my role models for a, a spokesperson for science, somebody who has helped shape uh, science policy in this country and in fact the world and has just been a consistent, uh, you know, cheerleader is the wrong word, but supporter, driver, uh, inspire of children, adults, astronomers, uh, and I think we all owe him a, a debt of gratitude for his consistent uh, support for science. And I know it's uh, not an easy thing to do, having lived in that environment for a short period of time. Uh, and, and if you look at uh, just daily politics, uh, science is, is something that needs to be supported in this country and has been a champion uh, in all of that. Uh, Another person that I want to thank and embarrass a little bit is Bruce Margon because uh, when I was selected as an astronaut, um, I was also on the short list to be a faculty member at, at a university and had to decide what career did I want. And I called Bruce. Bruce was the chair, I think, of the High Energy Astrophysics Management Operations Working Group at the time, or maybe one of the SAC committees, I don't remember which, but uh, I called Bruce and I said, Bruce, you know, I have this choice and I think I know what I'm going to do, but you know, I, I just want to talk about about it with some friends and uh, you know I value your opinion and uh, you know I been offered this uh, option to go be an astronaut there's no guarantee I'll ever fly uh, you know it's a total career change I've worked very hard to try and build a reputation as, as a solid astronomer astrophysicist uh, 